What's up? How you doing? I can't believe you're going back. Yeah, me neither. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, this is, this is, um, you're going to be on the south with Phil. And you were on the north twice, right? The, the first, first time, time was south, south in the north. north. Now you go. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's dive into this. This is going to be for my my blog. Climbing's in my blood too, and and it is a mental game too. So I wanted to have you on, and just nobody else knows Everest more than this guy, uh, Alan Arnett. Um, so thank you for joining us on this installment of my mind show. But um, first of all, how you doing, man? What's what's the latest? Uh, doing well. Just you know, out playing in my Colorado mountains, trying to stay fit because you never know when. Uh, when I'll go back to Nepal. Yeah. So what what is the plan now? What's uh, I know you had um, a big project. Well, c- first of all, I don't think I've talked to you since uh, what was it last year? No, 2014, right? Right. Yeah, K2 uh, summiting. You had an amazing uh, group of people that like, went up there, and and you became the oldest American, I believe, right, to summit K2. Right on my birthday, my 58th birthday, July 27th. That's pretty. Yeah. That's that's amazing. I followed along so closely to that. Your blog posts were amazing. And, uh, I mean, it's, it's one of these places that Everest you can read about, you can find videos, but K2 just seems so difficult to find information about. Yeah, that was the reason I wanted to blog uh, in a way that no one, at least that I had never seen anyone live blog uh, during the climb. You see a lot of documentaries after the fact, but, you know, it, it, you know because you do a great job of blogging uh, when you've been on Everest. And, uh, and so how much time it takes. Yeah. And so it took a lot of time to do the videos, to edit them, and then to upload them and, you know, and try to make a difference out there. But, of course, I'm doing it you know, to help raise awareness and money around Alzheimer's disease, which I know is very near to you as well. Yeah, so that's how I know Alan. Um, I started this whole memory thing and then climbing eventually because of my grandmother who had Alzheimer's. Um, she passed away in 2009. And Alan has a similar story with his mother. Um, and that's what he climbs for. I mean, that's, and you do such a great job. It's, uh, that it was part of the reason, you know, I saw you and what you did and I was like, that is something that I would like to try and do as well. It seems amazing. Well, you know, it's all about the memories, right? I mean, you're, you're, you're living proof that, um, that our brains can be trained to, uh, to remember things that we never thought we could. Yeah. But on the, on the other end of that spectrum is the disease and dementia in general that robs people of their memories. And they have, no, they have no chance to do anything about it. And that's the problem today is that with Alzheimer's, we, um, we have no way of stopping it and no cure. And it's 100% fatal. So that's why I continue to do my clients, trying to raise the awareness and raise money for research. Yeah. You know, I, uh, that's amazing. I, um, I was writing about it today on my blog that just like, I forget sometimes why I do the memory thing. And mm-hmm. cause sometimes it's just like, I got to memorize cards faster than this guy <laughs> or whatever. And I spent hours just by myself with a deck of cards, numbers and doing stuff that's really impressive, but ultimately what does it do for me? Um, but the, the, the bigger thing is that, you know, I'm training my mind obviously to do specific things, but in general, trying to make my mind uh, and my life more memorable. Um, and, and by training those exercises, I'm kind of reliving things in my life that I remember, experiences and things like that. And the more I go out and do things, the more I can kind of relate that to the memory sports stuff too. You know, I think it's, um, I talk a lot when I do my, my talking, my, my public speaking around uh, passion and purpose. Yes. And for me, my, you know, my, my passion is mountain climbing. And uh, my purpose is being an Alzheimer's advocate. And to your point about, you know, <laughs> sitting for endless hours trying to memorize cards and train your brain, well, the same, I don't do that, but I'm out in the mountains all the time. That's true. Yeah. And when I'm out, you know, for example, when I was on K2, boy, I, I hit a huge wall as I was developing pulmonary edema, and I didn't even realize it was happening to me. But, um, you know, in, in other clients I've been on, when I hit that wall, I go back to my purpose, and that is around Alzheimer's and, and honoring my mom and my, and my two aunts who died from it and all the people that are impacted by this disease around the world. And so I think it's important to go back to your, your purpose in life so that when you do hit that wall, you have an ability to push on. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And, and uh, let's talk more about that in terms of where you go mentally uh, when you're, you're, cause okay. A lot of people maybe don't realize that mountaineering and climbing is long and boring and painful. 
Um, it's the only really enjoyable part of it is maybe the views sometimes, uh, but the beer at the end of the, the <laughs> whole thing, right? So you got to spend a lot of time with yourself in your head uh, while you're slogging up a steep slope, you can't breathe, and it's maybe an eight-hour day or more or less. Um, so where do you go mentally? What, what do you do? I mean, you have to be very mentally aware and focused and strong to, to, to push yourself, right? Yeah, that's a really good, it's a really good point. A lot of people ask me, so what's the hardest part about trying to climb Everest? And, and I try to get beyond the, the normal you know, physical and, and altitude and, and the things that most people can talk about. But you know, boredom is a, really, it's a really major issue. And I know there are companies now that are marketing speed ascents and yeah. you know, trying to cut it in half. And, um, you know, and, and those are all legitimate ways of trying to shorten it. But for me, for me, I, I try to live in the moment, and I try to cherish the fact that I'm in a place that very few people ever get to go, yeah. even though you know the popular culture talks about how crowded Everest is and how everybody has climbed Everest. The reality is that it's out of, what's our world population, 7 billion? Yeah. That there's 4,000 people. So I don't know what the math is, but there's a whole lot of zeros after that decimal place. Yeah. So when we're there at Everest Space Camp, you know, we're in a we're in a in hallowed ground, both literally and figuratively. We're in a place that very few people ever get a chance to go, and I'll guarantee you, many many people dream of it. So for me, it's just cherishing that moment. I love to be with my teammates. Uh, you know, the camaraderie. We're just taking a walk around, you know, around the base of the Kumbu Ice Wall and looking up and visualizing what, uh, you know, those early Swiss expeditions must have been like, or even back in the early 20s when Mallory walked over there trying to find a route to go up. I mean, he came over there, he looked up, and he said, forget this. You know, there's no way to summit Everest from this side, and that's the reason that he went over to the north. You know, there's so much history around that mountain. So that's where my mind goes during the down times. Yeah. And then when you're on a steep slope and it's it's a long way to go and you got to put one foot after the other slowly, what do you do in your head? I mean, are you talking to yourself? Are you doing math? Are you uh, thinking about some like delicious food? What's going on? <laughs> you know, I focus on the mechanics. Um, I tend to get lost in, in the mechanics of short, simple steps, okay. of moving efficiently. Uh, when, I was, when I was summiting Everest in 2011, I was just uh, unbelievably fortunate to be uh, with Kami Sherpa. And he was, he was ahead of me, and uh, I was following him, and I was, look, I was watching him and how gracefully he moved, how efficiently he moved. As you know, his feet, I bet you never went two inches off of the ground, his crampon points, because as he moved, it was just this unbelievable ballet of graceful movement that didn't waste one ounce of energy. And as I watched him do that, um, I took that in. I said, okay, I'm going to do the same thing because I have a finite amount of energy and I need to conserve every single moment but also, you know, again, cherishing the moment, looking around and seeing stars that you've never seen before. The skies are so clear and, you know, and then thinking also about, you know, the mechanics of hydration and, you know, when was the last time I had a goo or whatever it is. So I really, I really am in the moment and I'm not trying to do, um, you know, mental exercises. I'm not that smart, Nelson. So <laughs> <laughs> I hang in there. I just, yeah. I just try to get through the day. <laughs> That's good. I mean. It's cool to hear you say that. Thinking back on my summit days on Everest in 2011 and 13, I did the complete opposite of that. I remember just I hurled myself up. You know, I would do like quick bursts and then just be like, okay, I got to get to that rock as fast as possible and then I'll rest. Um, and yeah. I think that, that, that screwed me a little bit. Um, you know, I am patient, but I feel like maybe not that patient, uh, hopefully a little more now. Um, but yeah, you're right. It, it, there's a lot of stuff that, to be said about being uh, very efficient with your movements. Um, I think a lot about like I'll do m some of my memory stuff in my head, and that's mostly to just forget of where I am, uh, so that I end up where I want to be um, right. before I even know. It. I'm like, oh yeah, that was I was just down there. Now I'm here. I was reviewing all the countries and the capitals or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so tell me, so you. You were you've tried Everest four times, is that right? It, right, four times in one summit. Yep. 
and and you it, that was 2011. You made it to the top. That was the year I was there. We met. Um, and what what day did you summit? Was it Friday the 13th, or you get went later? Uh, it was May 21st. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I remember that year. We went up Friday the 13th and uh, didn't make it. But I think we had okay weather. But you guys waited a little longer. I remember coming up. I think I I was coming up uh, going to Camp Three, and we were at the upper Camp Three, and you were at the lower Camp Three. That's right. And, yeah. And I remember you call you. Know, I I was going by. I was just in this trance, yeah. and I remember you know I hear you know, Alan, and I looked over, and I, I I don't I don't I remember I didn't recognize you, but later I put it all together, and you kind of gave me a thumbs up, and I was you know I kind of gave off, yeah, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> It just kept on stumbling by. <laughs> That's right. I remember that. That was a uh, that was a hard day. Yeah. Um, so and then uh, so okay. So you you had tried in what years uh, before? Two thousand two, three, and eight. Okay. Wow. And so I love my son too. over a ten year span, basically. Yeah. 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 Guy, I hadn't thought about it like that. But you're right. Yeah. And you know what's interesting is that um, I'm convinced. I'm not all my. I know for a fact that I uh, was in much better physical shape at age 54 than I was at 45 or 44 the first time I tried it. Really? I, was, uh, I, was, I was much better prepared, both mentally and emotionally. And um, I, I look back at my early attempts, and, and uh, you know, it's, a, it's a case study in what not to do. <laughs> That's true. But uh, I guess you learn from it, right? Would you say that the fourth time you did it, you did things that you obviously didn't want to do or repeat again from the first time? Like, did you, or was it pretty much the same? No, no, it was drastically different. Um, I, my entire approach was night and day. Okay. For example, uh, all the way from all from training to who I went with to um, my gear to, okay. um, but all of those things which you would expect. But the big difference was that my attitude completely changed. Uh, in, when I was first attempted in 2002, I was climbing for bragging rights. I was climbing to, you know, to, to be a summit, you know, summit bagger right. and uh, peak bagger. And in 2011, I was climbing uh, for, a, for a purpose in, in my life, of, you know, to honor my mother and around Alzheimer's. Um, but also, I gave myself permission. And, and this, is, this is probably the key element. I gave myself permission to enjoy the experience the good things and the bad things. Because you know that when you go on these expeditions, you, it's, a, it's a group of disparate strangers. You all meet in Kathmandu. And, you know, you look around the table and you're trying to figure out who can I trust my life to if I needed to? Or who do I want to spend time with in a tent at, at the South Pole? Um, you know, who's going to be my buddy? Who do I really want to avoid? And I surround, I made conscious decisions to surround myself with positive people, with like-minded people. Um, the people that had shared values with what I did. We all had a shared purpose, whether it was a summit, but everybody has, has a different reason for climbing Everest. And the other thing I did was I made conscious choices around when I, when I did hit the wall. And, for example, getting sick. In 2011, you know, everybody gets sick in, in Nepal. I don't care what the guides tell you. Everybody gets sick trekking in on the, in the Kumbu. Everybody gets sick at base camp. I don't care how good of a doctor or how good of a food it is, everybody gets sick. Yeah. So in my first attempts, when I got sick, I mean, it, it, it played a mental game on me. Sure. This time in 2011, I got really, really sick. I mean, I took the, you know, the Z-Pack and nothing happened. I finally you know, did the nuclear option with an uh, uh, antibody called Leviquin. And, um, and, uh, it, and I gave myself permission to lay in my tent for three days and do nothing but get well. Yeah. And I didn't, I didn't fret about it. I didn't, I didn't get all worried. Oh my gosh, here goes my summit. It was like, no, you're sick. You need to heal. Rest. Yeah. You need to give yourself permission to lay here, to drink, to eat, to rest, and let your body recover. And I went through that process, and I came out the other side of it. And the next day, I went up on my summit push. That's great. You know, so it's, it's, it is. It's, there's an awful lot that goes on in your mind. Yeah. Yeah, we, uh, as I can tell you, the mind can be conquered and trained for sure. Yeah, well, yeah, you're the man. You're I gotta, man. I, I gotta ask you, Alan. I don't know if I've asked you before, but uh, what's the summit like? What's the summit of Everest like? You know, um, it, it, it's a, 
it, it's a it's a it's a pointy kind of a rolling hill, you know, rolling top. A lot of prayer flags were up there. Kind of to my disappointment, uh, they had carved out a, a bench that you oh, yeah. can actually sit down on. Oh, okay. You know? So it wasn't quite the you know the the rugged spot that I had expected. There was no rocks, yeah. but uh, prayer flag all over the places. You know, pictures of Dalai Lama and, uh, and other okay. people's you know families and, and children and wives and husbands. But the big thing is that it is a place where, for me, I just felt unbelievably tiny and I and it was a sense of perspective you think that you know I, I, I really dislike the term of conquering the mountain right the, the mountain allows you to maybe summit maybe not and when I was standing on the summit I was oh I was unbelievably grateful I was humbled and I was you know honored to be able to do it for my cause but also at that moment I felt unbelievably small I felt very insignificant looking out. We had a perfect day. Uh, the wind was blowing. It was like 20 degrees below zero, 20 mile an hour winds. So it was cold and windy, gusty, but it was clear. And as I looked out, you know, I could see the summit uh, shadow oh, yeah. uh, casting off into the west. You know, I looked into Tibet, into Bhutan, into Nepal. You could see Makalu. I mean, Amin Ablam, which just, just occupies the trek in. Yeah. It just it just melds into the landscape. You can't even pick it out. You know, it's just another twenty thousand foot mountain. You know, when you're at twenty nine thousand. Um, but you know, I just it was really tiny. I felt really tiny. Very very grateful. Very humble. Yeah. Now I remember when I first uh, tried the Nali. We flew in. Uh, we landed on the glacier there, and we saw the peak. You know, and I hadn't taken a moment. We were taking stuff off the little plane and just organizing our expedition. And I look up and. There it is. And that was Denali, which is 20,000 feet. And I remember for the first time in the mountains feeling that feeling of being this big and unimportant and that I was just a part of this world, nothing more. Uh, right. Just a grain of salt kind of thing. And um, I think that's really what I like about the mountains is that it reminds you, it just resets you back to you know the basics, the elements, and, and you realize what you actually are, which is, is nothing. Even though you are, it's complicated because we're all about, we're talking about memories and, and making it all about us. But then at, at the same time, it's kind of like, it's not important. Uh, nothing is important because it's, it's, we're all the same. It's, you know, it's, it's interesting. Well, I think it again, I think it's, a, it's that sense of perspective and, and being uh, grateful and, and uh, that the opportunity to climb a mountain like Everest or a K2 is, is very few. And it's, it's a rich, rich opportunity. It's, it's nothing to be taken for granted or um, to be boasted about. If you're able to be successful, then um, it's a moment, it's a life moment, and it's a teaching moment, it's a learning opportunity. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and compared to K2 Summit, how did that feel? I, I mean, in terms of what they look like and <coughs> physically, but also how they felt um, inside. Yeah, yeah. K, the, K, the Summit of, of Everest, like I said, is, is kind, of, kind of pointy and rounded. Uh, K2 Summit is, is, is relatively larger. It's more of, a, more of a flat, round top. It's not quite as pointy as, uh, as Everest is. But the approach coming up to it, my gosh, it's at, when you leave advanced base camp at around 18,000 feet, it goes up at a 45-degree angle and doesn't stop. Wow. And, I mean, the, you know, you go into the western tomb on Everest and the south coal, so you have these, these parts where it kind of narrows out and it flats out. K2 has nothing like that until you get to the very top, up to around Camp 4, 25,000 feet. And there it flattens out just a little bit, but then it just picks right back up. Um, it is steep, it's unrelenting, it's unforgiving, it's rock, um, it's physical. It's the most physical climb I've ever had in my life. And again, I was developing pulmonary edema, which I didn't realize it at the time. Um, but oddly enough, talk about the mind. Um, I, I never considered turning around. Um, I had a very, very, um, a very deep moment uh, where I just felt like that uh, that I was dying on the mountain, and that's another entire story. But uh, I never ever considered turning around, and uh, I, my choices were to sit down in the snow and die, or to continue to go to the top. And um, I, I was able to draw upon energy of um, of people. 
you know, past, present, and future that uh, that loved me and cared about me, and and uh, I, I firmly believe I was able to channel that energy to to take myself to a place that uh, that I didn't know existed, and uh, so reaching the summit of K two, uh, oddly enough, and this is paradoxical, that uh, I felt almost nothing. Uh, I reached the top and I realized where I was. Um, you know, I took out my phone and I called my good buddy Jim Davidson and. Yeah. And um, and uh, he screamed at me to uh, double check everything, double check everything, which was great advice because uh, intuitively we climbed enough together that he recognized that I was not at the top of my game and something was wrong. But um, you know, and then I I did look around and did the three hundred sixty degree view and looked into China and saw those you know glaciers that you just don't see from any place else. And uh, back in the Goodwin Austin Glacier and and uh, and you realize where you are, and uh, yeah, and I, I did have a moment where I just completely lost it and broke down. Yeah, I bet. Wow. Well, I can't wait to read the book. You hope you're writing a book. <laughs> yeah, uh, that sounds riveting and super inspiring. I, I I mean, I don't think I'll ever climb K2, but I, I I would love to at least do the base camp trek and visit that part of the the Himalayas. It looks beautiful. So yeah, it's awesome. Awesome, awesome scenery, scenery trekking in through the Maldero. Yeah. Had you been there before in that area? I, I had. I tried in 2006. I, I put together an expedition and tried to do Broad Peak and K2. And oh, wow. uh, it, was, it was a total disaster. Because <laughs> uh, I, I organized it working with another company, but I did all the front work. And, and lo and behold, I learned that people lie. That people misrepresent their, their climbing <laughs> resumes in order to get on an expedition oh, wow. like this. <laughs> I learned a lot about life. That's crazy. <laughs> And now, so what's what's next for you? So you had your big, uh, you have a big plan. Um, tell us how that's going and what it is. Yeah, it's called Project Eight Thousand. Um, I've, um, you know, there's fourteen mountains above eight thousand meters on the planet, and I've been to six. I've summited three, and I would like to, over the next five years, knock off my remaining eleven. And my senior goal is to reach a hundred million people and to raise five million dollars for Alzheimer's research. Right. So um, I'm in um, I'm in the hunt for uh, sponsors because that's kind of how my life is these days. And uh, so I'm looking, you know, ideally I'd love to find one company that would sponsor me for the five years and and uh, prove that uh, getting old doesn't mean sitting in that chair watching NFL football. But you know, you can stay active and get out there and make a difference in the world. So uh, and if I can pull it together, I'll, and I may be back in Nepal this spring. Okay. If I do, then I'll uh, probably try to attempt low seat. Uh, if not, then maybe I'll try the Gasher Brahms in the summer. If not, then maybe Dollar Gary in the fall. So with uh, Phil, maybe perhaps. Right. That's great. Yeah, he was. Uh, so we were in Peru together, uh, and he, we were, he was saying that Everest might be his last. Uh, this spring might be his last Everest, and um, yeah, he's kind of sick of the crowd. So I guess that's why he's. Well, you know, the whole Everest scene is changing dramatically with respect to guiding. Uh, lots of very qualified uh, Nepali operators and Sherpas are coming into the into the um, into the market, and they're offering uh, anywhere from fifty to you know one hundred percent less than what the Western guides do. Yeah. And uh, but you know, with that price is commensurate the service. There's no Western guides with it. Uh, it's uh, they're qualified uh, Sherpa guides. Um, and uh, they're really changing up the market. So what we're seeing is a is a bifurcation in the marketplace when the, the traditional Western companies are raising their prices. For example, Himalayan Experience is now going to be seventy thousand dollars this year instead of sixty five and fifty five in the previous two years. And uh, other ones like Seven Summits Trek and uh, Destination Dreamers are coming in at thirty thousand. So we're seeing this this split. And also, we're seeing new people come into the into the upper scene, primarily from the middle class in India and also from China. So, um, you know, it's a it's a changing mountain. Yeah. And are you gonna uh, are you gonna be blogging about? I mean, if unless you're there, uh, if you're not, are you gonna be covering it like you usually do the season? Uh, yeah, that's my plan. Good. Um, and what else? The in, in terms, of, I mean, you been, you just uh, told me a little bit about what it's looking like now, but what are you hearing about this coming season? I'm hearing that uh, that most of the, the major operators are at half of their their previous um, loads. Less that, people, uh, yeah. yeah, less. So it looks to be. I would guess normally there's around um, around 350 Everest permits issued to Westerners, and I I'm guessing that we're going to see in the neighborhood of 200 to 225. 
for the spring. Wow. Okay. Um, and last year, uh, LOSI had 120 permits, which was the highest ever. And I think we'll see, you know, go back to the normal 30 or 40. Yeah. So I think the mountain's going to be, uh, relative to previous years, maybe 60% of the volume. Yeah. And you think that's because of the, just the fact that there were avalanches the past two years and the earthquake? Um, or is it more government stuff, uh, the permits? Yeah, I think, I think it's a little bit of all of that. I think people are, um, that the fact that Nepal, uh, the new constitution has been implemented in a, in a, in a really difficult way, uh, that resulted in all these uh, embargoes and right. uh, fuel shortages. That's discouraging people from going. Um, I think there's a train of thought amongst a lot of people that says the mountain and needs to settle after the massive earthquake and the aftershocks that have continued. So, you know, let's give it another let another year and see how it goes right. this year. Um, you know, the fact that the Nepalis, in, in theory, they've announced they extended the 2015 permits to 16 and 17, even though that's not been confirmed, um, that people are saying, well, I'll just wait till 17 and then use my, my permit for those people that wanted to go back. Um, and then I think there's a general feeling that... Uh, you know, that if you want to look at it from a, um, from a spiritual perspective, that, uh, you know, the mountain gods are telling people that, uh, you know, we need to let the mountain rest. Yeah. And so there's a fair number of people around the globe that will say, you know what, that's fine. The mountain will be there in 2017 or 18 or 19. I'll just wait till then. So it's complicated. Everybody has a different reason. Yeah, yeah. I think even uh, Peak Freaks, who I went with in 2011, I don't think they had a single person sign up. So they're not going to be there this year. That's what I heard. I don't know if that's... Uh, I heard something similar. Okay. Yeah. Um, you know, I know uh, Russell Rice did, uh, he did say publicly that he was at half. Wow. And, uh, but then I, you know, um, the other ones are saying that there's a lot of marketing involved. Maybe um, that too, yeah. <laughs> so it's very difficult to know because you're never going to have a guy, you know, Phil, Phil is very unique in his transparency and his uh, honesty about, you know, how he runs his business. You know, all the way from, you know, you pay a price for him, and that includes everything from tips to transportation. To and other companies, you know, it's a, it's a bait and switch strategy. You come in low, and then they nickel and dime you for everything else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's a lot of marketing, and it's really a buyer beware market in, in high altitude climbing. Yeah. What's your, what's your, what's your best memory? Actually, a better way to ask this, I guess, is what, what would you say? You don't have to give me the one, but one of your most happiest moments. You know, I remember. Um, I remember sitting in the tent at the South Pole, and um, I was with um, uh, a thirty-seven-year-old German lady, uh, Miriam, okay. and then uh, she and I were sharing a tent at the South Pole. And and God, we got we got up from Camp Three. We made it there really fast, in like three hours. So we arrived around 9 o'clock in the morning. And the weather was supposed to be great that day. And, of course, it was horrible. And, God, the wind is just blowing. And, you know, the tent is going, billowing in and out. And we're just, you know, we're in our sleeping bags and just laying there. And, uh, you know, had a little bit of oxygen going, like half a liter a minute, just to kind of take the edge off. And, uh, you know, and Connie would come over every now and then and unzip and stick his head in and go, you know, okay, okay, you okay? <laughs> And, you know, he'd bring in, you know, some melted snow, or some hot, you know, tepid water. But I remember being there at the South Pole just wondering if, you know, this fourth time, if I was going to be able to make it or not, if I was going to be given the opportunity. And um, letting my mind, and again, giving myself permission to, to enjoy the moment and let my mind go wherever it wanted to go. And sharing deep feelings with Miriam. Um, her Oma died from Alzheimer's. Okay. And so, you know, we shared uh, memories of our mother and her grandmother. And, and we talked about dreams and, um, you know, and what this would mean to us and if we got the opportunity. And it was just a moment of just, um, just, just purity. You know, it, it was just, it was, it was clean. It was clear. It was, um, there was no pretense. Uh, it was just, it was really an honest human uh, experience. And it went on for all day long. Nice. But then it's just like somebody walked over to a, to a wall and, and flicked the light switch at around 8 o'clock at night, the winds just stopped. Stop, yeah. And it cleared, and we just had an awesome opportunity to go to the top. Did she summit too? 
She did. Nice. And I, I, she, she was, was kicking, kicking my butt. I mean, she was she was ahead of me by you know by ten or fifteen minutes, and and I and so uh, um, the server that she was with it was it was her and him and and then Kami and I and you know and I I was just pushing as hard as I could to keep up with all these people. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Well, good. I mean, uh, I, thank you for your time. Uh, I know Alan's. Uh, Cause is amazing, um, and you, if you want to learn more, you can go to his website, alanarnett.com, right? Yep. Um, the best place to find anything related to mountains and the Everest updates. I don't know how you get all that information. It's probably just because you know so many people in the community um, that they tell you the little things. But it's you're kind of like the guy – you watch Game of Thrones? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're like, <laughs> you're like uh, the spider, right? Uh, Varys, but uh, obviously cooler. Um <laughs> <laughs> but you have all these little spies working for you on the Everest front. Um, anyways, well, good luck. I hope to see you on the mountain. Um, otherwise, uh, good luck posting and, and keeping updates with the, the mountain. My, my parents will be very happy. <laughs> yeah, some of my best followers are the parents of the people on the mountain. Yeah. So. <laughs> but, hey, good luck to you, man. I, uh, I, really, I really hope you have good weather and uh, good conditions and – I know you're with a great team with Phil and Altitude Junkies and their yeah. surface, so you're in, you're in good hands and, you know, just enjoy the moment. Yeah, that's right. Thank you, man. Thanks again for everything. I'm sure we'll talk uh, in the near future. Take care. Sounds good. Thanks, man. See ya. Bye.